enjoying. Well, hello, humans. I, uh, how, how are you guys doing? Good? Good. Wow, yeah. All right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Aza, I'm one of the co-founders for the Center for Humane Technology. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think, especially now that we're sort of in this middle of sort of a, a, a tech lash, where we have a, a set of grievances and scandals hitting our technology, and it's easy to just say technology is, is, is bad in the first place, um, to step back and ask, like, where really are we as a species? <laughs> Let's start with the, the real problem of humanity. Um, but to this, I'm going to turn to E.O. To Wilson, who said, you know, we as humans have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. In other words, we are chimps with lasers, or another way of saying that is chimps with increasingly autonomous self-improving lasers. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? So, you know, here's a dotted line. And in this case, the dotted line represents human strengths, right? And here is technology, which is growing exponentially powerful over time. And we've all been sort of fixated, if you will, techno pop culture, with that moment when technology overwhelms the things that we humans are best at, you know, often called the singularity. And what that misses is that there's another line, which is human weakness, our vulnerabilities the things that we need to paleolithically protect. And technology starts to overwhelm human weakness much before it starts to overwhelm our strength. We've all been paying attention to the point over there, the singularity, and we've missed this. And in fact, you know, are we oppressed by our electronic servants? Well, how else would you get all of humanity to bow their heads and then stroke their masters? Information overload was sort of the first time that we started to feel the effects of the limits of our humanity getting overrun. They were sort of like the Marshall Islands in climate change. There was the first thing to go. But all of those scandals and grievances, I'd argue, come back to this. Polarization, for instance, is a hacking of the human sort of proclivity to being attracted to, to moral outrage, to negative things. Like, negative emotions spread six times faster than positive emotions, at least one quarter of a study by MIT. So, you know, we are past this point, tech addiction, obviously. We've been upgrading our machines while we've been downgrading our humanity. So I want to start with a very old story, right? Which is, be careful what you wish for. Because this, in fact, is the story of AI. Um, be careful what you wish for. What did we, as a technology industry, wish for? What's allowed us to, you know, blitz scale? Well, we wished for human attention. And the story of be careful what you wish for says, be careful what you wish for, because you'll get it. It'll come true, but in an unattended way. So Gloria Marks did some research recently, and she shows that while we're on our screens, whether it's a phone or a computer, we now self-interrupt every 40 seconds. That is to say, every 40 seconds, something in our brain wakes up, and it's not a notification coming in. We switch tasks. We go check something. Right? The call is coming from inside the house. This is the experience of our mind being trained, terraformed, fattened for the extraction of our attention. It's no longer enough, right, that we just watch Netflix. We have to watch Netflix with another screen out. We are quite literally fracked for our attention, and it crawls down our brainstem, fracks it until there are many little parts. I got asked this question a little bit ago, which is like, you know, why do we, as a, as a, a civilization, as a society, why do we abuse our farm animals? I was trying to think maybe it's something to do with the Enlightenment and, and ascendancy of man. I'm like, oh, no, it's a really simple argument. It's the cultures that outcompeted the other ones were the ones that learned to treat animals as resources to exploit. So which are the companies now that make up more than 50% of the U.S. stock market? 
oh yeah, they're the attention economy companies. They're the ones that are learning to treat human beings as resources to exploit. When you take capitalism and you point it at the earth, it hollows the earth out and externalizes those harms into climate change, to climate crisis. You point the same system at the human mind and what happens? It hollows us out. And that's the feeling I think we all live with. And of course, it's an interconnected set of harms, right? Because if you ask for more attention, and as attention starts to go down, that means the number of interruption goes up, which means you can read fewer books, means the amount of content goes down, we're saying less nuanced things, which means that we're more polarized, which means that trust in other people starts to go down. And you can start to see how all of the sort of problems we're facing now, and I'm not arguing that it's only the attention economy, but it certainly is a major underlying force. It's the direction the water is flowing in. And it starts to downgrade our attention span, our relationships, you know? More than 50% of kids in the US say they don't get enough time with their parents at the dinner table because their parents are addicted. Downgrades our civility. Downgrades us humans. I think this is the global climate change or the global climate crisis of culture. And like climate change, it's an existential problem. Why? Because the collective capacity, collective action, it's going to take us to solve our problems is going up exponentially. And at the same time, our ability to cohere, our collective capacity to decide and have conversation, especially in the US, is going down. But unlike the climate crisis, you know, it's the people in this room, it's, you know, 1,000, 10,000 people in Silicon Valley that need to change to solve the problem. So, sort of a fast walk through. The attention economy creates a race to the bottom of our brainstem for our attention. Get our attention at any cost which becomes the race to hack human instinct. It's no longer enough to just get your attention, right? And those are techniques like infinite scroll, which is something I helped to, to invent and put out in the world, or pull to refresh, um, right? Do you know when you're addicted to your phone uh, and your email because you check it after you pee in the morning or while you pee in the morning, right? right? But it's no longer enough to just get and change our behavior. You have to crawl further into our values. You need to get you addicted to needing attention. So, what's one way you might get someone addicted to needing attention? Oh, I know. How about if we showed you every single day that people liked you more if you just looked different than you actually did? Well, that's Snapchat. 2017, over 50%, it's 55% of plastic surgeons in the US reported having seen patients that came in asking to look like their Snapchat filter, right? It's not just about behavior change. If I can get lower than behavior and into your values and your identity, then you're gonna go around pre-programmed to do exactly what we want you to do. All right, we've always lived in social systems, communities, tribes, societies, but now we spend a fourth of our waking hours inside of synthetic social systems, right? Our phones. And if you take all of human empathy and you restrict it to a little conduit, right, which is exactly what technology is, the, the shape of that conduit is clearly going to affect all of our relationships, societies, how we view truth, what we know from our friends. And who are those things designed by? And where is our voice in how those things get decided? So here's another question. Like, if I needed to get you addicted to needing attention to, to undermine your sense of self-esteem, how would I do that? Oh, how about if I showed you proof every single day, quantitative proof that people liked you more if you just lived a life that was a little different than it actually was? That's social media, right? We all know we get comparison sadness looking at the highlight reels of other people's lives, but this one's much more pernicious. It's like when you are projecting a version of yourself which you don't actually feel like you live up to, that's depression. So let's take a look. Percentage of women with high depressive symptoms. Over here, there's 1991. 17%, high depressive symptoms mean sort of suicidal thoughts or, 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 or uh, clinically depressed. And it's sort of holding steady so that by 2013, it's sort of going up and down, but rises just a little bit to 21%. This is really when, you know, uh, smartphones and, uh, 
and social media took off. And what happens? By 2017, it climbs to 29%. Now here's another thought. So this is sort of like, tab do, do people here play with like Gmail and they have a new autocomplete feature? Um, and to me, actually, I was surprised. I was not expecting to use it, but it's starting to sort of learn my voice. Um, and I, I hit tab way more often than I would expect. Okay, what happens when in another three years, Google releases a little statistics analytics program that shows you, hey, actually, you're getting more business deals done, you're responding to emails faster, you're more efficient. If only your personality was just a little different than it actually is. Right? This is like a tab autocomplete for your personality. And here's the thing, we are all going to want it. Right? This is a hack, in some sense, of our values replacing what is right with what is efficient. And that's, I think, going to be the biggest philosophical quandary of our times. Now, to go even a little scarier here, um, there's a technology called unsupervised style transfer. It's a field of AI. It's sort of those things where you can like, look at one image and then take the image and redo it in the style of like Van Gogh. Um, well, there are no laws against Google, say, looking at all the emails that you've responded positively to and quickly to, learning that style, and then selling the ability to rewrite any marketing message in that style. You can imagine Facebook doing this, where now they can rewrite, you, you type your message as a marketer, and it just rewrites it to be exactly most persuasive to you. And where is that, is that data privacy? Like, what, what is that? We don't yet have the terms to deal with the vulnerabilities of us as human beings that are beginning to get exposed. But let's go from there all the way up to the society level. So over one billion of hours are, are viewed daily on YouTube, and it turns out 70% of them are coming from recommendations. All right. That means from their, their AI system. Um, well, what did we wish for? We wished for engagement, which is really to say anything that gets our amygdala going. Um, the, the AI is sort of dumb. It just, whatever seems to work, it goes. So what percentage of results promote Flat Earth series? So these are recommendations, the autoplay videos. This is 2017 data from a guy named Guillaume Chaslow. So percentage that promote uh, of, of search results or videos that promote Flat Earth. For Google search, it's 20%. Not great, but okay. YouTube search, 35%. YouTube recommendations? Yeah. All right? And there's this thing, the Solomon Ash study on social conformity, which shows that there are three times more people that conform some or most of the time to what they think other people believe rather than using the evidence before their own eyes. It's powerful stuff. The same thing is true now of, of climate change being a hoax um, versus real. And it's stuff that we're feeding ourselves. In this case, 700 million hours a day we're dosing humanity with. Okay, this is a little more recent data from April of 2019. What are the most recommended keywords by these AI algorithms? Be careful what you wish for. The top recommended keywords are get schooled, shreds, debunks, dismantles, debates, rips, confronts, destroys, hates, demolishes, obliterates. Is it any wonder that this is what the world is starting to look like? Because if you sort of imagine a spectrum, right, of like, what, what would these algorithms show? They're just trying to get attention, right? Well, on one side, you have calm, science, rational. Um, and on the other side, you have sort of crazy, conspiracy, unnuanced, confronts, destroys. Well, of course, crazy outperforms the calm. And so what happens? You tilt all of society in one direction. And so when you read about Facebook hiring, you know, a thousand plus people to moderate the content, the image you should have in your head is, it's as if they've already tilted the world, so it's a giant hill, and there are these boulders rolling down of polarization and outrage and conspiracy, and they're hiring people to try to hold back the boulders, but of course there's just be more boulders coming all the time. It's the way to fix the problem is just tilt the thing back again. I think it's important 
especially for the entrepreneurs here, to know that whenever you code at scale, it's inherently a political act. All right, so summary. Synthetic social systems plus artificial intelligence or recommendation systems times the extractive attention economy, you're always going to end up in downgrading humans. So to return to this, that point up there, when technology overwhelms human strengths and takes control forever, singularity. But there's a point much earlier when technology overwhelms enough of our limits that we lose control forever. And that's the point we should care about because that second singularity, that's actually the second singularity. This one will happen first. And I've already shown that we've crossed the point in the bottom left. So how close are we to this human limit singularity? Well, here's a question. How many people in here think or have had an experience where, you know, they, Facebook must be listening to me on my microphone in my conversation because they'll show me an ad or a product that's just way too specific, right? So how many people, actually, I'm, I'm curious, look around. This to me is fascinating because the forensic analysis shows that Facebook is not listening. And to me, the truth is much creepier, and that is they're able to make predictions that good. So in the back of your mind, here's how to think about it. Um, this actually looks like, like matrix multiplication, but there is a little data voodoo doll of you on Google servers on YouTube servers. And it starts out as a sort of generic model, doesn't look like you, and they're collecting all the metadata, all that stuff we don't think we, we really care about, like your, your, your click streams and your toenail clippings and your, like, who you talk to, talk to and when and like, how you move your mouse around the screen. And this voodoo doll becomes more and more and more like you until you know, when you show up on YouTube, the reason why you think you're just going to watch one video but then you're there for over an hour is because you're playing chess against a super model or a, uh, a, a supercomputer model of you. It's an asymmetric power. And of course, I, I don't know how many people have, have seen this yet, but you know, the deep fakes, um, this is now like an old video from 2018. Um, these are all hallucinated, dreamed people. None of these people are real. It's not morphing between faces. These are all photorealistic, generated by an AI. And here's the thing to think about. In another, let's say, year, imagine getting a text. And the text is from somebody that you met at a conference, they say. Um, it's an unknown number, but they, it's, a, it's a picture of you and them. And, and the text says, like, hey, I don't know if you remember me. We had a great conversation, and I was going through my phone. I found, I found this photo of us, and so I, I'm, I sent it to you. Uh, and you're like, I don't really remember you, but the person's pretty cute and definitely looks very familiar, so you start up a conversation, you go back and forth, and he has to send some selfies. It's really just an automated hack, right? Because if I want to generate a face of a person you can't help but trust, it's really easy. I just take your top 10 friends on Facebook, which are publicly available, and I generate a new face, which is sort of the average of their features. So it's not, you know, the average of your friends, it's a new face. With the you have now 10 years, however long you've been friends with your, with your friends, being exploited. And then you just add a couple of people you liked on Instagram, and now you have a never-ending set of faces you find both cute and really familiar. What happens, like identity and memory, or memory is the foundation of, of identity, and what, what happens when trust in memory and identity for an entire society disappears at once. Here's another uh, thing that happened actually this year, April. Um, researchers at Harvard stuck these uh, probes into a macaque monkey's visual cortex, turned the monkey to face a screen, and they had an AI generate image after image after image until they could maximally stimulate those, those uh, neurons. And what emerged were these kinds of images. And up in the middle there, you can actually see the researchers, which wear blue caps and white masks. You can see the faces of other monkeys that the researchers were actually able to say, oh yeah, that's Anthony. Um, this is the first time we as human beings have learned how to create a camera of the mind, to be able to 
involuntarily extract memory from matter. Just think about the ways this is going to be abused. Mary Lou Jepsen, by the way, um, uh, in 2018, demonstrated at, on TED a new kind of technology, sort of like fMRI, except it fits in a baseball cap. It's a billion times higher resolution, a thousand times cheaper, and not only can it read from neurons, it can write to them. So this, to me, if we're not careful, is a kind of checkmate humanity with the kinds of power we have. This is about fundamentally asymmetric information and knowledge about us getting applied to us. So what should we do? I know, we should make our, our screens go grayscale, which is sort of like saying, you know, our house is burning, let's ban plastic straws. So, should we train people in ethics? Uh oh, this is the time warning. Um, should we train people in ethics? I don't, it's important, but not enough. Put it on the blockchain. <laughs> okay, how about pay us for our data? I mean, that's great, but again, it doesn't solve the problem. Protect our data doesn't solve the problem. The amount of prediction you can make about us is so overwhelming just using like your, the way you move your mouse around. You're uniquely identifiable, it turns out, just the way you move your head in a VR headset with one second of data. Should we wait for more research? I just wanted to use this slide. <laughs> no. <laughs> we need a new kind of human protective design, right? One which looks at us as human beings as the complex, fantastical creatures that we are and takes an honest look. We need to move from attention metrics to intention metrics. I have one more major idea. Is that all right? 30 seconds? What do you guys think? Yeah. Well, 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 well. <laughs> well. I, I do have to tell you yeah. that our producer, Matias, said he's loving your talk. And okay. so he, that's, and he said just now he really does. Uh, that's why we gave you an extra four minutes. Wow. Unfortunately, it's not a democracy. So <laughs> while I love them, they don't get to choose because mm. our next guy is also great. It's so 30 seconds, one major idea, let's go. I'm going to sit you. and listen too. Here we go. <laughs> Give it to us. All right. So there are two kinds of relationships in law. I think this is key. There's a relationship between equals, and that's like you know NDAs and, uh, and leases. And then there's a relationship between groups where one party has an asymmetric power over the other. So this is like a doctor. Like with a doctor, you have to tell them your weaknesses, and then, I mean, with that, they, they help you, but they could exploit you. With a, with a therapist, you have to tell them your weaknesses. Um, and there's a reason why therapists are not allowed to sleep with or date their clients, because they could clearly exploit and manipulate sexually their client. Doctors are this way, therapists, priests and confessionals, um, stockbrokers, uh, <laughs> these are called fiduciary relationships, fiduciary from the Latin for trust. And here's the thing, Facebook and Google, technology companies know strictly more about us now than our lawyers, our therapists, our doctors combined. And that means while they've been masquerading as a kind of equal relationships, which is why we're like clicking through those utilities and GDPR things that you just like, you click through and it's because they're saying that they're an equal relationship, but it's really an asymmetric relationship and they have to act in our best interest. Otherwise, they can be sued, they can, there's recourse. And that's the fundamental switch we need to make because over time, technology is becoming more and more and more powerful. And this is the only thing that can future-proof it so that technology is actually acting in our best interest. Amazing. Thank you so much.